Don't marry him, marry me. Grow old with me, die with me. Wear a battered cardigan on the beach in Bournemouth. Marry me. I don't even know you. Yes, you do. I couldn't feel what I feel for you unless you felt it too. Anna, we're in love. It's not our fault. Stop wasting his time. I haven't seen you in a year. Yes, you have. Only because you stalked me outside my studio. This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Here with me to introduce our illustrious guest is my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Closer is a terrific new Broadway play. Tough, brutal, fierce, everything I like in the world, Susan. <laughs> uh, it's about four people who betray each other in and out of bed, and it was written by Patrick Marber, also very well directed by Mr. Marber, and he is our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. Patrick, welcome. Thank you. Um, Patrick, for people who have not seen the play yet, can you just tell us from the playwright's perspective what it's about? Well, I think it's a play about love um, and sex and loneliness uh, and the, the need we all have to uh, find a soulmate and um, be happy. It's mm -hmm. about the pursuit of happiness, I think. Um, and that pursuit can be a brutal business. And uh, just the sketch in the plot a little bit for us. We have four characters all in their... 20s or 30s? Uh, one character in her 20s, two in their 30s, and one in, in his 40s. Mm -hmm. So a variety of ages. Mm -hmm. um, and they're strangers at the beginning of the play. None of them know each other. And during the course of the play, they all meet, fall in love, fall out of love, have sex, betray each other um, over a four and a half year period. And then by the end of the play, they're all strangers again. Mm -hmm. um, none of them will probably see each other again, I suspect. And what they've all the... screwed each other up in some way, haven't <laughs> they? They've all screwed each other? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what was the germ of this play? What got you started writing it? Um, was there a scene you wrote first or a concept you worked from? Well, yes, I've gone on record as saying that I was in a strip club in Atlanta <laughs> um, a couple of <laughs> years ago. And uh, that, there was a little germ there. But there were, there were other things as well. But the first scene I wrote in the play was a scene set in a strip club, mm -hmm. um, a strip club in London. Um, but it was personal stuff, stuff in my friends' lives. I mean, I have a lot of friends in London who think that they are in the play. And are they? Do you draw from...? Uh... Well, of course, but not specifically. Mm -hmm. The characters in the play are maybe four or five different people who I know all kind of welded together in some strange way. God, you run with a nasty crowd. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're charming. They're delightful. So, so these, are, these, are, these are young people in the 90s. They're just all totally selfish. Well, I don't think they're selfish, you see. I think that love sometimes makes us selfish. Mm. The play takes a view of love as not necessarily uh, being an emotion that brings out the best in people. Of course, in many respects, it does bring out the best in people. This we know, but why bother to write a play celebrating love? Um, that's been done. So this is a... Uh, uh, I think it's a romantic play on some it level. It is a very romantic play um, because people are dealing with a love that's very remote and philosophical mm. and not being fulfilled. It's, it's, ideally, I would like the audience to think of the play as romantic and anti-romantic simultaneously. Um, and so, for me, it's a play about love, but people who don't like the play say it's a play about manipulation. And people who like the play say it's an honest and truthful and accurate. Now, wait a minute, I like the play, and I think it's <laughs> about manipulation and savagery and brutality, but that may speak about me more than it does about the play. I'm afraid it does, yeah. <laughs> It's also, we should say, and I think it's a comedy, too, line by line, it is the funniest play on Broadway right now. Thank you. Well, I, yes, I think it's a comedy, but a, I think it's a romantic comedy that goes horribly wrong. Mm. Um, and it, yes, it goes into some dark areas, but its, it's spirit is comedic. Ultimately, it's mm -hmm. a comedy of manners. Uh, you didn't start out as a playwright, though. You started out, uh, I believe, as a stand-up comedian. That's right. I did f four years of stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. How did you get into playwriting? Well, I wasn't very good at stand-up comedy, as you can Took imagine, from my, <laughs> from my general demeanor. <laughs> yeah, right. um, I'll laugh a minute over there. <laughs> I did, uh, well, I did stand-up for four years, and then I did some TV and radio comedy. Mm -hmm. And I had an idea for a play, and I sat down and wrote it. And the play, the first one was Dealer's Choice. Yes. And uh, you and I discussed this for an interview I did with you in the Post, that when you got out of college you were a gambling man. Yes, I was. And Dealer's Choice came out of your... Poker playing experiences, poker playing, yeah. 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 Were you a, a, a gambling addict? I mean, were you oh, completely yeah. crazy oh, when you yeah. went to the tables? Oh, yes. Insane. Really? Um, and now I'm sort of under control with it, but uh, it wouldn't take a lot to drive me over the edge again, you know. 
<laughs> a Broadway flop, my girlfriend leaving me, the dog dying. That's it. <laughs> how, how about lunch with Ben Brantley, the uh, chief drama critic of no, the New York Times? That would be an enjoyable and interesting experience. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> this play has been well received by many critics, certainly in London and by a lot of critics here. It did, however, get, I thought, rather surprisingly negative review from, from Ben Brantley in the time. In the Times. First of all, just as a young playwright on Broadway, what was your reaction to reading that review in the New York Times? Well, I think, uh, obviously, I wasn't jumping up and down with pleasure, <laughs> nor was I devastated. You see, in, in London, there are maybe ten critics who count, and a play is judged a success or failure dependent on a sort of mean average mm -hmm. from those critics. So it's very hard as a uh, London-based writer to get your head around the idea that this review is some kind of monolith. Um, I also think it's disrespectful to every other critic That's a good to, point. to perceive the New York Times as a monolith, and they are but pygmies chipping away at it. Um, so, I, <laughs> so I don't have... True, but... <laughs> I, well, I don't think it is true. Um, but I, I don't, so I don't have that perception of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, one is powerfully aware that it's an important review, but box office went up and up the day after the review came out. Um, and we all know that a, a good review in the Times doesn't necessarily sell tickets. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, it doesn't do you any favors to have a, a bad review. But um, it wasn't a review that made me angry. Mm -hmm. It was just, uh, oh, well. you know, mm -hmm. And he's entitled to his opinion. And that's the deal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fair enough. The thing that. Uh, was curious for me about it was it was the only review that had any quibble whatsoever with the acting mm -hmm. whereas every other review and I've read maybe 25 or 30 reviews not that I'm obsessed um, <laughs> have all have praised the acting to the skies so that that was the the only uh, anomaly in it mm -hmm. we should say the actors are uh, Natasha Richardson yes Anna Friel uh, Rupert Graves and Karen, Karen Hines. Karen Hines. Yes. Uh, all giving terrific performances. They're wonderful. Yeah. All brought over here from, from London. Well, Natasha lives in New York. Right. Yes. Right. Right. There's there's a scene in the play that's much talked about, the internet scene, where um, <laughs> the Rupert um, Graves character is on the uh, is on the website and um, talking to the doctor. They're communicating in the net. Well, in and the, the doctor chat room. in the chat room, right? And the doctor thinks Rupert Graves is a is a woman, and yes. he pretends to be a woman. And he comes on to him, and he arranges a meeting. It's a really frank, brutal, very funny scene. How did that scene come about? Just as a writer, what was going on in your mind when you when you put that scene together? Well, the the play is much concerned with deception and lying and uh, the comedy of lying. Um, and the awfulness of truthfulness in many respects. And this seemed to me a perfect place to explore the art of lying in a comedic way. Um, and it just kind of amused me. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I'm not actually on the internet myself. People find this hard to believe. Oh, I'm, really? I'm a complete technophobe. So I went to an internet cafe and <laughs> cruised a few um, chat rooms and affected to be uh, a lesbian lady called Patricia and <laughs> did quite well. And I thought, you know, you can do this. You can get away with this. You can um, fool people all of the time on the internet. Yeah, and it's kind of fun. Um, innocent, harmless fun. <laughs> um, but in the, in the play, the ramifications of that event are, are, are quite specific and, and big. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's the oldest trick in the world, the... Uh, the man disguised as the woman or the woman disguised yeah. as a man. It goes back in literature all the way back to Shakespeare and before it's yeah, I mean, this play an in old comedic uh, device with a, with a new twist to right, it. Right, exactly. I mean, for all of our talk about this being, you know, a hip, trendy kind of a play, it actually seems to me to have its roots in classical, in classical theater. Yes, very much so. I uh, think, I think the, um, the condition of the play and what the play is saying about the nature of love and life in general could have been said in the 17th century, and indeed was. Yeah, I'm afraid um, you're right. There's nothing's changed. Uh, absolutely, and and that pleases me greatly. <laughs> <laughs> it was as bad then as it is now. And or as, and or as complicated were, <laughs> then as it and is. People now. were horrible to each other back then, and they are now. And as, as you said, you do have this wonderful device that the real trouble in your play comes every time they tell the truth. That, that's certainly a problematic area. Yes. Yes, but I I think where I differ from most perceivers of the play is that I think this is a play about four nice people who behave badly rather than a play about 
for horrible people who behave badly. I think they I love my characters. Um, and I, I would be very happy to spend time with all of them. I think they're charming and delightful and vulnerable. And they go through hell in this play, but that's my fault, not would theirs. You, would you want to be in love with any of them? He is in love with oh, them. I am. Oh, I'm yeah. in love with all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot uh, of talk now about um, um, young Irish writers, young British writers, a flowering of talent over in London. What's going on? Is there something in the water over there that you're all <laughs> drinking and writing terrific plays? What's well, happening? I think journalism is happening. I think that journalism is saying there's this group of people, um, and so there. So Therefore, there is this group of people. Um, We're always having to spot trends, you know, to come up with these articles. Absolutely, but you create trends as well. Mm -hmm. um, because having, having spent a couple of months here in New York, I've seen some wonderful theatre by young or youngish writers. And I could just as easily, write, were I a journalist, write a piece about the, the boom in, in uh, New York theatre. I could, I could talk about Wit and Sideman and This Is Our Youth. And Killer Joe. Mm -hmm. These are fantastic plays. All off Broadway, though, and you guys, you British Side writers, are, Broadway. Oh, side is, but you guys are all on Broadway. They, for some reason, producers here don't want to take the risk on these no. American playwrights on Broadway. But we're on Broadway because we've come from London, and we have to go on Broadway to do the productions as we want them. Mm -hmm. If we want to get British actors over, we have to put them on Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, Dealer's Choice was done off Broadway. Um, maybe Closer will get done off Broadway one day. A few minutes left, Patrick. You have said that one of your biggest influence, and it seem, he seems to influence a lot of, particularly young British writers now, they all keep telling me this, is David Mamet, mm -hmm. early David Mamet. What was it about Mamet that you latched onto? Early and late Mamet. Uh, really? I'm as much influenced by his, his writing about the theatre as I am about his plays. His essays on acting and Absolutely. directing? Absolutely. And... Yeah, his, <laughs> his aesthetic, uh, which is a rare thing <laughs> to have an aesthetic. He's, um, it's the rigor and the discipline of it and the simplicity um, to find the poetry in the, in the ugliness of urban living. It's, I don't know, I'm, but I'm as much influenced by Arthur Miller or Pinter or Shakespeare or, or as anyone, but my style at the moment has clearly come from Mamet. Mm -hmm. Kind of brutality too. You don't mind well, I dispute that word. this brutal. Yeah. <laughs> but, that's uh, a word that is going to hang on closer forever. Brutal. That's what we always put on that play. Well, I can think of worse words. Than that, <laughs> Where are you going next? I mean, what do you? You know, you've done the sort of romantic comedy going wrong mm. now. What plays are rattling around your head now? What are you thinking about doing next? I want to write a comedy. A real out and out, knock down, drag out, run for your trousers kind of farce. <laughs> well. Some, some, not necessarily running for your trousers, <laughs> but uh, yeah, a big urban comedy. But you did comedy on TV. Did yes. You? Yeah, so you're, that's, that's your world. Yeah, but I, I like the sound of laughter in a theatre. Mm -hmm. I enjoy that. Um, and I've got an idea for a comedy, and I'm, I'm going to go back to London and start writing it. How about movies? We talk over here about playwrights. Uh, when they have some success here, they immediately get snapped up by Hollywood. Surely you must be fielding offers. Could you see yourself? living out there in Malibu and <laughs> banding in the theater forever for the riches of could final you, analysis and movies like that? Could you see me out there in Malibu? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I could imagine it, but it, I'm very happy with my little life in London. It's, it suits me. And you're happy in the theater, too? Very much so, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, the play is Closer. I loved it. Susan, from her... Um, more mature perspective, shall we say? No, I, I it's a little cool to it. No, but. no, no. I liked it very much, but I found it uh, disturbing, which is a compliment. Thank you. Yeah. It's a terrific play. Pay no attention to Ben Brantley. The man doesn't know what he is talking about. Uh, Closer is at the Music Box Theater, written and directed by Patrick Marber. Terrific young playwright. Thanks a lot for being our guest tonight. Pleasure. Thank you. Sing a gay slave song. Sing to your pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> our, our viewers contact us and they say, you should have more performers. And then they say, you should have more women. So it's payback time. Michael, <laughs> introduce the guests. We're already having a good time, as you can see. And who would not be having a good time with our two terrific guests? Julie Halston is a wonderful actress and stand-up comedian. And Leah Delaria is a wonderful actress and stand-up comedian, too. And they, and they are the both... The comics are here. That's right. And they are both now starring in Paul Rudnick's play, The Most Fabulous Story Ever Told, at the Manetta Lane Theater. Julie, you are playing a 
disabled lesbian rabbi. Give me your money. <laughs> and, uh, Leah, you are playing. I'm just playing a lesbian. It's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> now the show. I went out and did a lot of research, though. I'm and... sure. Yes. <laughs> did you hang out with her too? Uh... We heard about it. <laughs> Oh, you did. Yes. Talk about theater dish. It's <laughs> off Broadway. We're all in the same dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> a den of lesbians back there, right? Oh, no, it's a, it's a, I'm the only one. Oh, no, 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 no. There's also Peg Healy. Oh, who Peg plays Healy, yes, yes, yes. Who is an open <gasps> lesbian? Whatever that means. Whatever that means. But uh, it's actually a, it's a lot of fun, and there is a lot of Spice Girl power going on back there. Oh yeah, yeah. we we do have we that. do have a lot that. of girl power in this There's show. There's a lot of girl power. <laughs> Um, now, uh, we do have to say, unfortunately, that the show uh, uh, has announced that it's going to be closing mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. You guys just went into it, and there was a lot of big an announcement. I mean, you're two well-known people in the theater world coming into the show, and all of a sudden, boom, guess what? Welcome aboard, and I guess so we're on. losers. <laughs> I guess we're losers. <laughs> no, no. Here we go. Losers. <laughs> losers. We're losers. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, we'll see what happens. I, uh, I, I think the show... You know, people who have seen the show absolutely adore the show. It's mm. it's 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 a beautifully written show. We all know Paul Rudnick is one of the great wits of our time, <laughs> and everyone loves this show. Uh, now, this, of course, is your uh, second experience with a, um, a show that you've gone in and gotten a lot of attention, and is it is closing. You were on the town, and you could have gotten better reviews and a better publicity campaign, and yet. You, it was on your shoulders, and you couldn't save that one. What happened? Uh, with On the Town, it was in the wrong theater. Yeah, That's big. what I think. The, I think that the theater was too big for it. Or maybe it is me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's me. I don't. Hi, I'm Broadway's newest star, and I'm in the unemployment line. And <laughs> Their career will turn yeah, around. Yeah, I just think that, I think that the Gershwin Theater is a barn. It's a 2,000-seat theater. I think only specific <clears throat> kinds of plays can go into that theater. And um, as soon as uh, George said, we're going to go in the Gershwin, I got on my knees and begged, not no, theater. not the Gershwin, any theater but the Gershwin. Wait another month. Get another theater. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, you know, he really thought he could do it, and um, the show actually got pretty pretty good reviews. I mean, there was, uh, there was only two bad reviews mm -hmm. out of all the reviews, and um, it just, you know, I just think that that's a barn, and when you go through the, you know, the winter doldrums right, on right, Broadway, okay. yeah. Yeah. It'll kill it. Mm. It'll kill it. Well, maybe the problem now for the most fabulous story ever told, as we were talking about earlier, is that there's so many plays out there, off-Broadway plays and big plays uh, on Broadway. Yes. Right? There, there's a lot of product, mm -hmm. as, we, as they say. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is also gearing up toward Tony time. There's right. a big emphasis on Broadway. People uh, are, you know, trying to rush to see Broadway shows and whatnot. And I think what, what we're sort of, you know, hoping is that people kind of pick one or two off-Broadway shows and we'll be the one. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. uh, like I said... That's why you got up so early in the morning to come on and do the show. Well, right. I mean, you know, when you see the show, you realize it it's is very a great, funny. great it, show. It's too bad they can't hold on till Pride Month. Not that you're just a show for gay people, but you, you do great business then. Absolutely. You know, when that crowd comes in. I do want to ask you guys just a... It would be smart to do that. Yeah, it'd be yeah. smart to do that. Yeah. You know, I always think, and I, you know what, I'm not a producer. I'm not the one that has the money. But I think <clears> once you've thrown a certain amount of money at something, throw a little bit more if you know you're going to make some down the line. Are you disappointed in your producers? I'm um, not disappointed in my producers, no. <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm not. Yeah. Not uh, at all. <laughs> never, I'm not going to get a real I, I, answer no, no, to that no, no, question. No, no. I really do. I mean, no, I'm I, not. That, that, that's that's your real answer. answer. I'm not. Yeah, that, no, there's... There's obviously something I'm disappointed in, but I'm not going to tell you what it is, and it's not the producers. <laughs> and not saying otherwise. <laughs> uh, I do want to talk to you. You are both... You are a dish queen. Uh, <laughs> you are trying to get me in trouble. You have, have you read my column today about Forbidden Broadway and the no, rats was backstage? Oh, that's <laughs> no, that's <laughs> one thing I'm glad about On the Town Closing, because I was in terror of what Forbidden Broadway was going to do to me. <laughs> a fat chick singing I Can Cook, too. Right. I knew they were going to wheel me out in a hand cart, you know, 3,000 pounds. Singing, you think I can cook? Well, I can eat too. I, knew it was, I was in just I'm, terror of I'm it. I'm telling you, if only Forbidden Broadway had that skit there because it's looking a little ragged. It's not very funny. They need that. Uh, okay. I do want to be serious for a moment here. I want to ask you about All right, be serious. performing All right. in this play. You are both um, stand up comedians. Mm -hmm. Do you. I guess you would. You bring your own sense of humor to characters that Paul Rudnick has already set, or are you careful to hold back and really listen to your director and, and do what he tells you to do? Or are your personality such that you just can't, you remake the character in your own way? Well, I think uh, if you're going to cast Leah Delaria or Julie Halston in a play, I think 
you understand that they will bring a certain amount of what they do <laughs> to it, to an extent. Um, what's very important, I think, for comics to understand, you know, when they go into plays, is the play is the thing. The play is the thing. It's not about your act. Mm -hmm. It's not about even your character, necessarily. Um, the, the drive of the show has to be to tell the story. However, if you, uh, you know, put in a, someone like Leah Delaria, who has a very well-known persona, or Julie Halston, who has a known persona, that they're going to bring a little mm -hmm. bit of what they do mm -hmm. to that. And I think Chris Ashley, our wonderful director, understood that completely. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually adds to it. And, and, and I disagree, <laughs> but that's... <laughs> well, well, tell but, us why. But, but, but no, I mean, the, for me, be, first of all, the part was written for me. So that's a little... I, I have a little different... Oh, Paul Rudnick wrote the... Mm -hmm. The part was written for me, so, uh, so there was a little bit of my personality already kind of, you know, he was taking me into consideration when he wrote it. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I was an actor and a singer before I was a stand-up, mm -hmm. and I couldn't... so. You know, I mean, I think that as a stand-up, I do one thing. As an actor, I do something else entirely different. And you can shut it off. You as a matter of fact, I have to lose a muscle as a stand-up, and um, that's something I work very hard on. And the muscle is listening, to the, uh, playing to the audience. Uh. You have to lose that muscle when you're acting because the play is the thing, and what's going on stage is the thing. And what the, what, the only thing you want to do is listen to them for the laughs for when to come in, technical acting. Right. But as an actor, it's about what's going on in the people on, on, that, on that stage. I try not to bring my personality into a character. That's really important to me as an actor. But I do think producers, again, thinking like a producer, I think if, as a producer, you might think to cast people like Leah Delaria, Julie Halston, people who have personas that and are personalities. known. Personalities. And personalities that are known, that you <clears throat> might not mind. Right. If some of that, as an actress, yes, you can't bring that. You have to bring what the character is. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying. Well, that. Well, see, I think that that in some ways that's the death of, of of theater. I think that when producers cast, you know, I'm just a, just just off the top of my head. Keep going, baby. The killer <laughs> nanny as Rizzo in Grease, because uh, <laughs> you know, because because uh, while well, she gets a lot of press and she'll put butts right, in the right, seats, right, right. it might be the death of, of theater. I really I really think that you know. I mean, I think one of the reasons I was such a hit as Hildy was that no one in their right mind would think of you in this thought that the quote-unquote big dyke Leah Delaria could go on stage and do what I did. Mm -hmm. But I can do it, and there was a director out there that said, wow, yeah. she can do it. Genius casting. Let her, let her go for it. And I think that when, when, you, when you get a director and a producer that is willing to let the talent be talented, mm -hmm. not just put butts in the seats, because sometimes just the talented talent will put butts in the seats, we might, we might see a, a, a really artistic rebirth on yeah. Broadway. I agree with you. Well, yeah. oh, I agree. It's just that I also know that Greece ran for a long time with frightening people. Oh, gosh. <laughs> frightening people. You doing know, that you were role, just... But it kept that. Thing and now going. the Menendez brothers and in it, Greece. It, it, yeah. Yeah. We want to keep that thing going. I know. <laughs> we keep it going, but I'm also thinking that, you know. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> I mean, for my money, the death of theater is footloose. I don't know if you've seen oh, that. But okay. that has nobody's in it, yeah. and uh, there will, will remain nobody's, I think. I, no, I'm brokenhearted. We have to stop. Uh, well, we're sorry for uh, the most fabulous story ever closed. <laughs> the <laughs> most fabulous story <laughs> that ever closed. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and that's the title of it. Let's keep that. You should keep the, the most fabulous story ever told is closing at the Manette Lane. But uh, in the uh, couple of weeks left, uh, we urge you to go down to see these two very funny ladies. Leonora. Maybe Rosie and Theater Talk will, will turn do it do around. It. Yeah. Rosie and Rebel. That's right. Theater that's Dish that. might turn it around. Theater Dish. Right. That's true. <laughs> Julie Halston, it's always a pleasure to see you. Leah Delaria, it's very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank Glad you to be here. We should add that Leia's at Joe's Pub for the next two Mondays. Julie? I'm doing a Stanley Tucci film next week. I'm filming it, and we are both doing a drama department benefit honoring Paul Rudnick on April 19th, which is going to be a... It's actually a sellout already, apparently. Terrific. So. Well, thank you very much for being here. guest. Tonight. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. We'll see you next time on Theater Talk. And now for any Tony nominators who may have missed it, here's Leia Delaria and Jesse Tyler Ferguson in On the Town. Oh, Come okay. up to my place. Let's go to Cleopatra's Needle. Let's go to my place. Let's see what I make her store. Let's go to my place. Let's go to Lindy's. Go to Luke's house. Let's go to my place. Let's see Radio City and Herald Square. Let's go to my place. Go to Rubens. Go to my place. Go to Macy's. Go to my place. Roxy. Go to my place. Go to my place. Go to my place. Go to Here's little cooking kid. with gas. Oh, my God.
Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Friedrich Lowe Foundation, the Harburg Foundation, and public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theatre Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing exciting opportunities for theatre lovers. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.